Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wa man ahasanu qawla min man da'i lallahi wa amilu salihau. Wa qawla inna ilmil muslimin. Rabbi shali sadri wa yisalli amri wa ahlul uqdata min lisani afkahu kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV Network. The Peach TV English, the Peach TV Urdu, the Peach TV Bangla and the Peach TV Chinese. As well as the viewers on my social media that is the Facebook, the YouTube channel, the Twitter and my Instagram. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to welcome you to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir Naik, Season 2, Session 4. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked you and you are unable to reply or any question that you find regarding misconception about Islam that are spread on the media, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my four social media platforms but I would recommend that it's preferable that you ask as a text message your question on the WhatsApp by mentioning your question in brief along with your name, your profession, your city and country of origin on the WhatsApp number plus 6011269538395. I repeat, you can mention your question in brief as the text message along with your name, your profession, your city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. Before we start taking the questions, I would like to speak for a few minutes on the Beirut explosion, the actions to be taken and lessons to be learned. As many of you may be aware, four days ago there was a massive explosion in Beirut on Tuesday on the 4th of August 2020 at 6 o'clock in the evening that's Beirut time or 3 p.m. GMT and in this massive explosion it was one of the greatest explosions in the recent time in which more than 150 people were killed and more than 5,000 people were injured and more than 300,000 people became homeless. According to the president of Lebanon, the cause of this massive explosion in Beirut was because of 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate that was stored in the Beirut port in warehouse number 12 and this 2750 tons of ammonium nitrate was stored about seven years ago in 2013 when a ship was traveling from Gibraltar to Mozambique and it halted on the Beirut port and there was a technical problem in that ship because of which it had to stop in Beirut and the owner of the ship he abandoned the ship because of which a court order was taken where this 2750 tons of ammonium nitrate was stored at the Beirut port in warehouse number 12. Actually this 2750 ton it was supposed to be sold or disposed of even though several reminders were sent to the court and to the government by the port authorities for the last several years no action was taken this ammonium nitrate is actually used as a source of nitrogen for agriculture fertilizers it's also used along with fuel and oil for explosives, for mining, 
or in construction industry. It has also been used by militants as an explosive. Actually, this ammonium nitrate to store is very safe as long as you take precaution. But if you do not take precautions, over time, it may absorb the moisture, it may turn into a rock, and it's very dangerous that it can be inflammable. According to the manager of the port of Beirut, there was a request for repairing the door of warehouse 12, and because of which they were doing some welding to the door of the warehouse number 12, and after that he doesn't know. According to reports, we have come to know that there was a fire at the Beirut port at 6 o'clock, Lebanon time, very close to warehouse number 12. And later on, the roof of the warehouse number 12 caught fire at 6 o'clock, Lebanon time. And few seconds later, there were many explosions. People thought it was fireworks. And 30 seconds later, there was an enormous, massive explosion, which ruined many structures and buildings around the vicinity of the port. And the effects were for kilometers. And the windows of the International Port of Beirut, which is nine kilometers away from the site of explosion, the windows were shattered. 200 kilometers across the Mediterranean Sea, the explosion could be heard in Cyprus. According to the reading, they said the explosion was equal to 3.3 scale of earthquake. It was massive. And because of this explosion, there was a crater created of 140 meters wide and very deep at the site of the warehouse where water accumulated and there was a ship which was closed which was blown to the dock because of the explosion. And in this explosion, more than 150 innocent human beings were killed. More than 5,000 people were injured. According to the mayor of Beirut, more than 300,000 people became homeless. And the population of Beirut is approximately 2 million. So 15% of the population of Beirut, they became homeless. And half to 1 million people directly or indirectly were affected by this blast. This was an accident. It was negligence. What action should be taken? I would request the Muslims all over the world that the least we can do is pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the people who are affected by this blast. And as we know, more than 61% of the population of Lebanon, they are Muslims. More than 52% of the population of Beirut, they are Muslims. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he forgive the Muslims who have died in this blast and may grant them Jannah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he ease the difficulties of the Muslims and non-Muslim families who have died in this blast. May he elevate and may he make it easy for the people who have been affected in this blast. May he give shifa, may he cure the people who have been injured in this blast. And may he give shelter to the people who have become homeless. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the suffering of all those people of Lebanon who have been affected directly or indirectly in this blast. The least the Muslims can do is pray for the people affected by this blast. The second thing we can do is we can support financially whatever we can to help the victims of this blast. And Alhamdulillah, there are many charities, Muslims and non-Muslim NGOs in Lebanon and in different parts of the world, which have started collecting funds. We have in America, in European countries, in different parts of the world. And Alhamdulillah, I request the Muslims that whatever your capacities, whether big or small, whatever you can, 
we should become part and try and support this noble cause with whatever amount that we can. The third we can do is those people in Lebanon or in Beirut who have not been affected by this blast should support the people who have been affected by this blast. There may be people of Lebanon who may be less affected. They can support the people who have been more affected. We require volunteers at the ground level to help the people who are injured, to help the people who have become homeless, to help the people who may not have food to eat because of the situation that took place suddenly because of the massive explosion, because of this blast. Whatever we can physically, because of the pandemic which is there, the COVID-19, it may be difficult for the foreigners to enter Lebanon, but yet there are people who are trying. Whoever can physically support, they should. And last, what we can do is try and spread this message that we should not be negligent about the information of the blast, the actions to be taken, and the lessons to be learned. What can we as Muslims learn from this tragedy? Number one, we should not be negligent. This tragedy happened because of negligence. We should see to it that we should be careful and we should take precautions wherever required. For example, we should see to it that in our home, we have the kitchen, many people keep the gas open, unattended. There may be someone who lights a fire and there can be explosion in the kitchen. We keep and we store things inflammable in the wrong place, which is wrong. And we may not be careful in how we store the inflammable items. All these are lessons to be learned that we have to be careful and we should not be negligent. The second thing to be learned is that we do not know when will be our last day of our life in this world. Normally, many of the Muslims, we pray for the Muslims all over the world that are suffering. And I too, every tahajjud, I pray for all the Muslims in the world who are suffering. And I particularly take the names of the people who are suffering more. And I start with the people, the Muslims in China, in Xinjiang, who are in concentration camps, who are being persecuted, who are being oppressed. The Muslims in Burma, the Rohingya, in the Rakhine state, many people have left their homes, millions are staying as refugees in other countries, I pray for them. Even the Muslims of Palestine, the Muslims of Syria, the Muslims in Yemen, the Muslims in Afghanistan, the Muslims in Kashmir, the Muslims of India that are being persecuted by the Indian government, the Muslims in Bangladesh. And the list is long. I take the names of the people who are more persecuted. But generally, we pray for all the Muslims, even the others which are being persecuted in different parts of the world. We know that amongst the Muslim countries in the world that are there, maybe 25% are being persecuted on a great level because of the persecution maybe in China or maybe in Burma or maybe in Palestine or Syria or Yemen because of persecution or because of war. There may be another percentage that may be less persecuted or less oppressed. There may be some living in a country where there may be very little problem for them. And many a time these people living in the countries where there is not a major problem may think and pray for the people, for the Muslims of other part of the world, but they may think that these people, because of the war zone, may die any time. But they may never think that even they too can face a calamity. And what happened in Beirut? I'm sure that almost all the people who may have been killed, they may never have thought that that was going to be the last day of their life. They might never have thought 
that they will never see the next day in their life. So it's a lesson for us that irrespective of whichever part of the world you are living in, irrespective of what is your age, irrespective of what is your status, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are healthy or sick, you may never know when will be the last day of your life. That's the reason a Muslim normally should lead a life and should be prepared that maybe today is the last day of his life. So what should he do? We should take a lesson from this that we should be prepared to face our Lord if we are to die today. And for this, we should see to it that we should do all our faraiz and stay away from the haram activities. We should see to it that we believe in Tawheed, that we pray five times a day, that we do all the faraiz and we stay away from the haram, the major sins and the minor sins also. If we are sure that we do all the faraiz and if we are staying away from the major sins and we every day ask for forgiveness in our salah, in our tahajjud, then even though as we are human beings and we do sins, we can always hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we pray for forgiveness, when we do istighfar, inshallah Allah will forgive us. So if every day we offer salah and we ask for forgiveness for all the sins we are doing, if Allah forbid we have to die that day, inshallah it will be a great blessing for us. And inshallah there are high chances that we shall enter Jannah. So this is a lesson to be learned that we don't know how long we will live. We should be prepared that we will die today. At the same time, we should plan for our future. What we are going to do tomorrow, maybe after a few weeks or a few months or a few years, this is what a moment, a believer does. He plans for the future, but is prepared that he can die today. He may not live to see tomorrow. This is a lesson for us. What happened in Lebanon was accident. It was negligence. It can happen in any part of the world. Maybe we too can face a calamity. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He forgive our sins and may He make us pray for the victim throughout the world, including the Beirut blast. And may we learn lesson from these incidents so that we can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first question on the WhatsApp is from Riyadh from Bangladesh and is asking the question why Allah punishes people in the grave as there is a possibility that this person may get acquitted on the day of judgment. Similarly, a person who is not punished in the grave may be found to be guilty on the day of judgment. The question posed by Riyaz is that why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish the person in the grave? Maybe on the day of judgment he'll be acquitted. So won't it be injustice? And maybe you may not punish a person in the grave and he may be held responsible on the day of judgment. So isn't this wrong? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, that Kullu every soul shall have a taste of death. And your final recompense will be on the day of judgment. And anyone who is saved from the fire and is admitted into Jannah, into the garden, has achieved the purpose of this life. For this life is goods and chattels of deception. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Imran chapter number 3 verse number 185 is telling us that the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. That means the final hisab kitab, the final tally of the reward and punishment will be on the day of judgment. That means if you have to get a reward, you may get part in this dunya, in this world, part in the grave, part in the hereafter. Or if you have to get some punishment, you may get part in this world, part 
in the grave, part in the hereafter. But the hereafter is the final recompense. The final tally of all these three put together would be what you deserve as a reward or as a punishment. The question asked by Riyas that what if you are punished in the grave and on the day of judgment you are acquitted. So won't it be injustice? Or if you are not given a punishment in the grave and you held responsible on the day of judgment, won't it be wrong? What brother Riyadh is asking a question may be correct for a normal judge or if you and me are a judge where you are human beings. He fails to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ilm gayb Do you think Allah doesn't know what is the reward every human being deserves and what is a punishment every human being deserves? For you and I who are normal human beings, we may not be aware. Or if you and I are a judge, then we will not know until we hear the lawyers and we know what's happened. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Maliki Umuddin. He is the master of the day of judgment. He has ilma gab. He has knowledge of the future. He knows exactly what will a person deserve as a reward and what will a person deserve as a punishment. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that for an unbeliever, whatever good deeds he does, his reward will be in this dunya. He will not get any reward in the akhirah, in the life after death. As for the punishment, it may be part here, part in the grave, part in the hereafter. As for the believers, both the reward and the punishment can be part in this world, part in the grave, part in the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilm gab. Allah knows that this person will get 50 points of punishment. So he may give 10 points in this world, 20 points in the grave and maybe 20 points in the akhirah. It cannot be possible that a person receives 10 points punishment and Allah will give 20 points punishment in the grave. It's impossible. Allah has ilm gab. He has knowledge of the future. He cannot do such a thing. You and I as a human being can do that. So this question is logical for a human being, but not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he has ilm gab, he knows exactly what is the total punishment every human being will deserve, what is the total reward that he'll deserve. And all these three put together is the total punishment he deserves. And that's the reason it's mentioned in the Quran that on the day of judgment, no one will object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Neither the Muslims, neither the non-Muslims, even the kafir. Even the unbelievers, even the non-Muslims who would be put in the hell, they will never say that they have got injustice. They will only ask Allah that why don't you give us one more chance and Allah will say it is too late. This was in brief the answer to the question. The next question posed by Mohsin Munir from Bradford from UK. Can you recommend any good Urdu translation of the Quran for my parents? A similar question is asked by Mubina Hashmi from Pakistan. I am a Muslim and I want to read the Urdu translation of the Quran. Kindly recommend me a translation book or a tafsir. I normally read the English translation of the Quran. My Urdu is weak as far as reading is concerned. But I did ask some of the people who are knowledgeable in the field of Islam and they told me that one of the good translations in the Urdu language is Ehsanul Bayan by Maulana Muhammad Junagiri. It's also printed by the King Fat Printing Press in Medina, Saudi Arabia. And the second good translation in Urdu is Tahsir al Quran by Sheikh Lukman Salafi, who was the secretary of Sheikh. Bin Bas, Rahimullah, may Allah have mercy on him. So these two are the good Urdu translation with authentic and inshallah if you read them, you will benefit. The next question is from Tahir Sultan from United Kingdom. Is it allowed to have pension after one has retired from a government job? As far as pension is concerned, there is nothing wrong in receiving pension whether you are doing a government job or from a private company but 
the only point to be noted is that most of the pensions that are given whether by the government or whether by private companies they involve interest and riba because most of the company the government when the pension is deducted from the salary of the employee along with a percentage given by the employer this money is kept in fixed deposit in banks or in money instruments which earn interest and later on after you retire you start getting benefit from this as we know very well that interest is haram and allah clearly mentioned in the glorious quran in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 278 and 279 that those who give up not the demands of riba of interest take notice of a war from allah and his rasul so interest is a major sin not only is it a major sin the quran says allah and his rasul will wage a war against you and in the book the qabair the major sins imam al dhahabi lists interest as the 12th major sin and the prophet peace be upon him said it's mentioned hadith of mustadak al hakim that the lowest level of riba is like doing zina with your mother so because of this if that pension amount that you receive involves riba then we should try and take out that element of riba because you may not be involving yourself in riba but your employer may be so if someone is forcing riba on you what you can do is you can calculate what is the principal amount which is from your salary what is the principal amount which your employer has put and what is the element of riba so when you get this pension after you calculate if you get rid of this element of riba calculate the percentage it may be 10% 20% 30% whatever the percentage is give this away in charity to the poor people for some noble cause because this riba has come involuntary to you voluntary taking riba and giving charity even that is haram but involuntary somebody is forcing you it is your money it is your right that the employer is giving you benefit but if it's involving with the principal amount the quran says you can keep the principal amount and give away the riba so that riba portion percentage from the pension if it is involving the interest should be given in charity but the best would be if the pension is from islamic source in the islamic country that are following the islamic sharia they put it in taqaful which is an islamic based insurance or an islamic based sharia compliant pension fund in which everything is halal so if it's based on sharia principle you can keep the complete amount of pension if it's involving riba you get rid of that percentage and inshallah you can utilize the percentage which is free from riba we have uh, on the facebook bala gwani aksal suddin barabwa parvez ahmed may allah bless you and your family jazakallah shukran saif sadun may allah bless you may allah bless you too mohammad masood rana moidun mansoor mashallah i am an i love you i love you too mubashira ifat nach bike saif sadun may allah save you jazakallah hasan sheikh samir ali nazim ahmed mohammad irfan yusuf zaman mohammad masood rana abba toro may allah reward you may allah reward you too may allah grant you jannat firdaus may allah grant jannat firdaus to you too sonia akhtar amal azam mohammad nazim sheikh javeri afzal many are doing duas may allah bless you too that was on the facebook on the youtube ali shah meer aqib niyaz kausar ahmed junaid halal yusuf samsur nusrat imroz current affairs arif khan javed hussain assalam alaikum wa alaikum salam abdul wasay 
محمد بلال علی فہیم ہزاری محمد رفت محمد ارشاد علی السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام جنت جبیر گور آف پانڈے عرب خان مینی آر سینگ سلام وعلیکم السلام ٹو آل آف یو اینڈ مین اللہ بلیس یو دا نیکسٹ کوشچن از فرام عبد اللہ محمد فرام بنگلہ دیش از بیٹ باکسنگ الاؤڈ ان اسلام فرسٹ لیٹ از انڈرسٹینڈ واٹ از بیٹ باکسنگ بیٹ باکسنگ از اے ووکل پرکاشن امیٹیٹنگ دا ساؤنڈ آف دا ڈرم مشین وتھ یور ماؤتھ یور لپس یور ٹنگ اینڈ یور وائس دس از دیر سنس اے کپل آف سینچریز اے گو اسٹارٹیڈ So in the 19th century, though the word was then called as beatboxing, originally beatboxing was imitating the drum machine. And later on, as time passed on, they started imitating the other musical instruments. And now, lately, almost all the instruments are imitated by the human vocal voice using the mouth, the tongue, the lips. And it was made famous in the 20th century, in the late 1960s, by the Beatles, Paul McCartney. History tells us that even Michael Jackson made it famous, and so on and so forth. To come to the question that is beatboxing permitted in Islam? Almost all the scholars, they agree that musical instruments are haram in Islam. There are very few scholars that you may find lately or in the past that have permitted the use of musical instruments. There are various hadith which have prohibited musical instruments. I'll just quote you one which is very important. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 5590 that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that there will be among my followers some who will make illegal intercourse that is zina adultery and fornication wearing of silk drinking of alcoholic drinks and the use of musical instruments as lawful as halal this is one of the signs of the hour before the day of judgment before the end of the world a prophet said this is the sign that there will be some people from his ummah who will make zina adultery fornication wearing of silk drinking of alcohol and the use of musical instruments as halal indicating that using musical instruments is haram the prophet only permitted certain times the use of duff that's an open and a drum in Eid or in weddings but generally all the other instruments are haram there are various fatwas since musical instruments are haram a human being imitating the haram musical instrument according to scholars is also haram and when Sheikh Utaymi was asked that is beatboxing permissible He clearly said, even imitating the haram instrument, the musical instruments with your mouth, whether it be drums, whether it be other instruments, it is forbidden, it is prohibited. So beatboxing is not permissible for the Muslims. It is not allowed that a Muslim should imitate the sound of the musical instruments, whether it be drums, whether it be other musical instruments, whether it be sound, this is haram and the Muslims should abstain from it. Even listening to it, and even involving in making sounds of haram musical instruments with your mouth. The next question is from Sadiqur Rahman from Bangladesh. I am an architect by profession. Can I design a temple or a church or any other non-Muslim religious architecture? 
Also, while designing a five-star hotel, the client's requirement in most cases is to design a bar in it. What should I do in such a case? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number two, that help each other in bir and taqwa, in righteousness and in good deeds. But do not help one another in sin and in transgression. So Allah is very clear in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number two, that help each other in good deeds and in righteousness. But do not help each other in sin and transgression. Shirk is major sin in Islam. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 48 and Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 116 that if Allah pleases, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, idol worship, He will never forgive. If you ask for forgiveness before dying, inshallah Allah will forgive you. But if you die as a mushrik, Allah will never forgive you. So in the religious places of the non-Muslim religious places, in temples and churches, but natural, there is shirk, there is idol worship. So how can you design a temple or a place of worship of the non-Muslim where other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worship? So in no way can you design or help in the construction of a place of worship of a non-Muslim Neither can you give donation, neither can you support, neither can you be an architect, neither can you be a worker in the construction of any place of worship of the non-Muslim. Regarding the second part of the question, that in a five-star hotel, can you design a bar? All of us know that alcohol is prohibited in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you believe, innam al khamru al maysuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rush to muramli shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Since alcohol is prohibited, you as a Muslim cannot design a bar in which people have alcohol. A bar is a place where people drink alcohol. You cannot design it. You can design a five star hotel. If your client forces you to design, you said, no, I can design the complete five-star hotel, but I cannot design the bar. If he forces you, then don't take the project because designing a bar is also haram. It is prohibited. The next question is from Aman Kumar. Aman Kumar is a revert from Bihar, India. He's asking a question. I am from a Hindu family. I have converted to Islam one and a half year ago after watching your video and of Maulana Tariq Jamilji, which was explained by a Muslim friend of mine. But my family does not know this and they are skeptical. I tried to convince my family that the idol they worship is wrong, but they don't believe it. If I explain, then they say, that is the whole world, in brackets, Hindus, are they wrong? And are you the only one who's right? I also told them that it is okay, you do not listen to me, you read the Hindu religious book, it is written in it, but they do not even read it. And in the house of a Hindu who worships Murti idols, I feel that I have not done any shirk, and that I have to go through a lot of hardships. So I want you to tell me what to do. Lastly, I would like to thank you for helping me recognize the truth and accepting Islam. I would like to thank you too, Brother Aman Kumar, for coming to the straight path and accepting Islam. May Allah reward you and may Allah bless you and may Allah grant you Jannah. As far as the question is concerned that when you tell to your family members and to your parents not to do idol worship, they say that are all the other people in the world wrong? Are the Hindus wrong? You should tell them that whatever majority people do is not always correct. Many centuries ago, most of the human beings believed that the world was flat. That does not mean that they are right. Today we know that the world is spherical. So majority is not always correct. People in the past thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Today we know after science has advanced that the light of the moon is not its own light, 
it is the reflected light of the sun. So just because majority people have a belief, that does not mean that the majority are always right. And if that is the argument that your family members are giving, that majority are Hindu, that's the reason, and they do idol worship, therefore you have to do idol worship, you have to tell your family members that in the world, the people that practice maximum any religion, number one is Islam. In senses, theoretically, maybe Christians are more. But the people who practice any religion, number one are Muslims. The number one religion which is practiced maximum in the world is Islam. There are more than 2 billion Muslims in the world. More than 26% of the world population are Muslims. Compared to Hindus, we are much more. Hindus are about 1.2 billion. So if you are going on majority, there are more Muslims in the world than Hindus. So does it mean if that is what you believe that more people are correct, then you should be a Muslim? As you ask the question that you are living in a Hindu family and they are not aware that you have accepted Islam one and a half year back, what should you do? Even though you are abstaining yourself from shirk, my advice to you would be that slowly and with hikmah, explain to your family about the haq, about the truth and reveal to them that you have accepted Islam. Initially they may be angry, they may be sad that you have accepted Islam, but that is the best because once you explain to them and reveal to them that you have accepted Islam, inshallah, inshallah, they will agree with what you have done. It will be easier for you to practice your deen. It will be also easier for you to convince them about Islam. And it will be easier for you to prove to them that what they are doing, idol worship, is wrong. It's a shirk. You can very well quote the scriptures. You can give them my cassette on similarities between Islam and Hinduism where I have proof from their scriptures that idol worship is wrong and inshallah it will be easier for you to practice your deen and even get them to the straight path. So my request to you is reveal to them the accept Islam with hikmah and continue your dawah with them inshallah that will be the best for you. We have on the Facebook Sona Islam Abdur Rahman, Mukul Haq, Muhammad Tahidul Islam, Muhammad Riyad, Mithun Mullah, Suleiman Khan Shuo, Assalamu Alaikum Sir, may Allah bless you, may Allah bless you too, Ansuddin Khan, Oid Hassan, Muhammad Saikat, Mehtab Murtaza, Muhammad Naji, Farhan Rahman Rabi, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam, Muhammad Rakibul Hassan Ananda, Hassan Siam, Noraz Naveed, Sasadul Karim Shahdin, on the YouTube, Arib Khan, Assalamu Alaikum Sir, Wa Alaikum Salam, Safraj Ahmed, Yusuf Samsar, Junaid Halal, Infallible Quran, Muhammad Irshad Ali, Risham K, Aninda Ahmed, Bilal Akash, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. They are doing duas for me, I do duas to you also. Next question is from Arif Ansari from Uttar Pradesh, India. One of my non Muslim friends has asked me. All religions are superstitious and false. The truth lies in science, which is constantly developing. Religion says that God is all-powerful, merciful and all-good. If that is so, then why do millions of children in the world suffer from hunger, cold, etc. As the great Russian writer Dostoevsky asked in a famous novel, Brothers Karamazov, why does God, who is said to be merciful, not have mercy on them and give them food, clothes, shelter, etc.? Why is there so much poverty, unemployment, malnourishment, sickness, etc. in the world? If God is powerful and merciful, 
Why does he not abolish these and give everyone a decent life? The question posed by the brother is that one of his non-Muslim friends is saying that all religions are superstitious and they are false. Science is ultimate and is always developing. I agree with the brother that most of the religions, they are superstitious and they are false, but not all. Islam, alhamdulillah, is based on haq, on truth. As far as science is concerned, if you compare science with the religious scriptures of the various religions, I do agree with you that most of the religious scriptures, they will fail the test. But if you compare modern science with Quran, you will find out that there is not a single verse in the glorious Quran which is against any established science. There are more than 6,000 verses in the glorious Quran out of which more than a thousand speak about science. And there are many scientific facts mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago which was discovered recently, 30 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back, 300 years back. Now who can tell us how come the glorious Quran 1400 years ago mentioned about these facts in biology, in zoology, in oceanology, in embryology, in medicine, in hydrology, which we came to know recently, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, about water cycle, that every living creature is made from water, how was the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, and hundreds of things, which science came to know recently, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, the Quran mentioned 1400 years ago. How can you justify this? Out of more than 6,000 verses of the glorious Quran, more than 1,000 speak about science. And not a single verse of the glorious Quran is going against established science. So if you compare Quran with modern science, Alhamdulillah, Quran is far superior. And science, as you rightly said, is developing. And many things what the Quran has mentioned, which science hasn't confirmed yet. But neither can it say it is wrong. Inshallah, in the near future, science will even confirm that. So Quran is far superior to science. But I do agree, if you compare with scriptures of other religions, all the other scriptures besides the Quran, they will fail the test. So Quran is a book based on haq, on truth. Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. More than 6,000 ayats are there, signs are there, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. Coming to the last part of the question, that why are millions of children in the world dying of hunger? Why is there suffering in the world? Why people are homeless? Why people are in pain and suffering? The reply to this question is, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, Chapter number 67, verse number 2. Alladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life in the world is a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the human beings on the face of the earth, has sent us as a test for the hereafter. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155. Surely, we will test you with something of fear and hunger, with some loss of lives and goods. And what you have earned through the toiling in the world. And give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere. That means Allah is saying every human being will be tested with fear and hunger with the loss of goods and lives and your toils what you have worked hard and accumulated but give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere as i mentioned this life is a test for thereafter and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different human beings in different ways allah cannot have the same paper the examination paper keeps on differing every year so allah tests different people with different ways some with wealth some with health, some with poverty, some with diseases. So Allah is testing these people.
people with hunger, with fear, with suffering, do they yet have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are some people whose children are born handicapped. The children are masoom, they are innocent. But it's a test for the parents. Oh, Allah tests different people in different ways. And depending upon how will you react? Will you curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Will you get angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or will you say, okay, amna saddakna, I accept it. So this is a test. Allah is testing different people in different ways. Nowhere does it say that a person who will suffer in this world will go to hell. Nowhere does it say that people who are poor will fail in the test. In fact, it is easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. Allah is testing so if we have sabr, if we have patience, if we yet have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be successful in the hereafter. So since this is a test, the atheists will not be able to understand because they don't believe in the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for a believer, for a moment, he realizes that this world, the life that we lead in this world is a test for the hereafter. And we are here to pass this test. So with this way, inshallah, if you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey what is mentioned in the glorious Quran and the Sayyid, inshallah, you will be successful in this world. The next question, posed by Nadir Ahmed from Bangladesh. Sir, I am 20 years old and really inspired by you in the field of Dawah. When I try to convey the message of Allah to the Hindus using the references of Chandogya and Sveta Sveta Upanishad and Yajurveda that God is only one, he has got no idols, no images, etc. Some Hindus counter me by saying that they believe God is one but God has come to earth in different forms and different ways from age to age like Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu, etc. But we worship all his forms. How can I reply to them logically? The Buddha asks the question that when he tries to convince the Hindus about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding monotheism, they agree that God is one, but they say that God has come in different forms like in the form of Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu. How do I reply to them? What they are referring to is avatar. Hindus believe that Almighty God has come down on the face of the earth in the form of avatar. Now what is the meaning of the word avatar? Avatar is coming from Sanskrit word av and tar meaning to, to descend down. And here according to Sanskrit grammar it means that some position of Allah is descending down. Some thing possessed by God is descending. It cannot be God himself. So anyone who says that avatar means God himself coming down is totally wrong. It is against the rules of Sanskrit. It means Allah has sent down someone. So in the real context, what they are talking is about messengers. And that's what we believe. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent 124,000 prophets on the face of the earth. By name, 25 are mentioned in the Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, may peace be upon them all. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down 124,000 prophets on the face of the earth. Maybe these people, Ram, Krishna, they were prophets of God, maybe. Though the name is not mentioned, so I cannot say Ram alayhi salam, but maybe they are prophets. But even if they were prophets of God, they were sent only for those people at that time. Because all the messengers and prophets that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were sent only for those people and for that time. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, because he was the last and final messenger, he was sent for the whole of humanity. So what we have to understand that the avatar they are talking about is the same concept as the messengers, as prophets, what we Muslims believe. So we have no objection that maybe Ram was a prophet, maybe Krishna was a prophet, maybe Brahma was a prophet, we have no problem. But they were prophets of God and they were not God themselves. Because the Vedas clearly mention that in the Ajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, and Svita Sita Upanishad, Chapter number 4, verse number 29, that Natasya Pratima Asti, of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit means an image. 
a photograph, a painting, a sculpture, a statue, an idol. So na tasse pratimasti of that God, there is no pratima, there is no painting, there is no photograph, there is no idol, there is no sculpture, there is no image. So we have no problem in believing that these were messengers, but surely they were not Almighty God. So if you explain the concept of avatar, inshallah, you will be able to get them closer to Islam. But the next question is from Rizwan Bashir from Punjab, Pakistan. Sir, I want to get into missionary work like Sheikh Ahmad Didad to give dawah to the Christians of Pakistan. Please guide me how can I study the Bible, which points or verses of the Bible are compulsory for a dai to read and memorize. Brother Rizwan from Pakistan has asked a question that he wants to become like Sheikh Ahmad Didad. May Allah grant mercy to him. May Allah grant him generous for those. And he wants to do dawah to the Christians of Pakistan. The best I would recommend to you is that you should read the booklets written by Sheikh Ahmad Didad. And he has written about 15 to 20 booklets. They have been compiled in two volumes, the choice volume one and choice volume two. All put together there are approximately 15 to 20 booklets. So if you read these booklets, if you memorize them, it will be very helpful for you to dawah to the Christians. There are various video cassettes available of Sheikh Ahmad Didad. You can go on the internet, you can go on the YouTube, you'll find them available. Officially released by them were somewhere close to 80 to 90 videos. You can watch them, you can memorize them, it will be really helpful for you. Besides Sheikh Didad's books and video cassettes, you can even go on my website, zakirnaik.com, which has a separate section called as International Dawa Training Program. When you go to the International Dawa Training Program, there is a section only on Christianity. If you open that section and read, you will find the common question asked by Christians regarding Islam. Ten common questions how the Christians try to prove the divinity of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and so on and so forth. The various questions, the answers are given. Regarding which verses of the Bible should you memorize for doing dawah to the Christian, there is a separate section in which is mentioned verses of the Bible. And we have given first maybe 15-20 verses of the Bible, then the next 15-20 verses of the Bible, maybe a couple of hundred verses. If you memorize these few hundred verses from the Bible, you will also be able to debate the Pope. Then we have given maybe 25 verses of the Quran to memorize, the next 25, the next 25, maybe a couple of hundred verses of the Quran. If you know these couple of hundred verses of the Quran, and memorize a couple of hundred verses of the Bible, inshallah, you can even debate with the Pope. And if you read the complete section on Christianity and memorize it, and you can even see my video cassettes, one of the good video cassettes is similarities between Islam and Christianity. There's also a debate of mine with Dr. William Campbell, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, a debate of mine with Pastor Rukundin on was Christ really crucified, peace be upon him. So if you see these videos and see these debates, inshallah, that will be very helpful for you to do dawa with the Christians of Pakistan. The next question is from Muhammad Farooq from Chittagong, Bangladesh. Some of my Muslim brothers complain about you that you prove Quran is true by science. As a result, it is understood that Quran has less status than science and science seems to distinguish between the truth and falsehood. What is the opinion? The comment made by the brother that when I try and prove Quran with the help of science, I am trying to prove that science is more superior to Quran and that is totally false. If any of you hear my video cassettes on Quran modern science, they will come to know that I am comparing our yashtik, the yashtik of the Muslims, that is the Quran, with the yastik of the non-Muslim, which is science. And I said that Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And in every age, the Quran has proved itself to be the word of God. Previously was the age of miracles and Quran is the miracle of miracles. 
Then came the age of literature and poetry. Alhamdulillah, Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they acclaim the Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. And if you compare Quran with modern science, you will come to know that Quran is far superior. When I'm comparing Quran with modern science, I'm telling what science has come to know recently, 30 years back, 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back, Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. For example, Quran mentions the creation of the universe. In Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral azina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kana taratkan fafatak nahuma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This is similar to the Big Bang. And the Big Bang says that our universe was one primary nebula. There was the secondary separation of Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the sun, the stars, including a planet Earth. And that's how the universe came into existence. This was first described in 1973 by a couple of scientists for which they got a Nobel Prize. That is hardly 47 years back, 50 years back. Imagine Quran mentioned 1400 years ago, the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, what we came to know 50 years back, the Quran mentioned 1400 years ago. So when I'm comparing the yastik of the atheist, of the unbeliever, of the non-Muslim, that is science, with our yastik, the Quran, I say Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, it's a book of ayats. And there are more than 6,000 ayats, more than 6,000 signs in the glorious Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about signs. And when we compare, we come to know that our yashtik, the glorious Quran, is far superior. So when I'm comparing science with the glorious Quran, Nowhere do I say that science is superior. All what is mentioned in the Quran, 14 years back, science has come to know recently. So what I'm trying to prove that our glorious Quran, the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the ultimate book. It is far superior than modern science. So if you hear my lecture, correctly and with attention you will come to know I am uplifting the status of the Quran far superior to the status of science. In no way am I saying that science is more superior than the Quran. I am using their yastik science with our yastik the Quran and Quran alhamdulillah excels and proves it is superior to science. Hope that answers the question. Next question from Muhammad Shweb from Dubai. Can I pray Isha at 2 a.m. due to difficult working hours? As far as the time for Isha is, it is after the time for Maghrib ends, approximately, depending upon different countries, approximately one and a half hour after sunset. It starts and is up to Nisful Lail, that is up to midnight. This is the time between which you should offer Salah. You cannot offer Isha or any prayer before time or after the time expires. So offering Isha after Nisful Lail, that is midnight, is prohibited. Since you are staying in Dubai, now I believe the Maghrib time in Dubai would be close to 7 p.m. And the sunrise is at 5.50 a.m. in the morning. So if you calculate from 7 p.m. when the sun sets up to 5.50 sunrise, it's approximately 10 hours 50 minutes. So the Nisful Lail, the midnight would be 5 hours 25 minutes after sunset, which is 12.25 a.m. So in Dubai, you can offer Isha Salah approximately one and a half hour after sunset. That is from 8.30 up to 12.25 midnight Nisful Lail. You want to offer at 2 a.m. in the morning, it's not permissible. 
And as far as Isha is concerned, the Prophet said, the more you delay before you sleep, it is preferable. But before this full line. So if you are living in Dubai, you can offer your salah anytime between 8.30 p.m. up to 12.25 a.m. You cannot offer after that or before that. You are saying that you are working and you're doing a job and because you're busy, it's difficult to pray Isha on time. This is not accepted at all. And since you are living in Dubai, in UAE, which is a Muslim country, it is not possible that anyone can prevent you from offering Isha Salah on time. Irrespective whether you are working in a Muslim company or non-Muslim company, you can always request them to give you a few minutes to offer your Isha Salah. It is preferable you offer in Jamaat, go to the mosque, and there are many mosques in Dubai, take a short break of few minutes, no one can prevent you. If someone prevents you, go and complain to the authorities of Dubai. I am sure, inshallah, they will reprimand your company. No one can tell you that work is compulsory and can prevent you from offering salah, especially in a Muslim country, especially in the country where majority are Muslims, especially in the Gulf country. In Dubai, I've been several times to Dubai, I've spent several years in Dubai. You may be feeling shy, very well go and tell your boss, whichever company you're working in, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, and tell him I want to offer Isha Salah in the mosque, he can never prevent you. If he prevents you, go and complain to the authorities of Dubai. Inshallah, they will put the person in the place. The next question is from Maida from Kashmir, India. How can one become punctual in offering Salah? This is a very good question. That how can one become punctual in offering Salah? And according to me, each and every Muslim should be very punctual and should take care that they offer salah on time. All the males, all the Muslim males should offer five times salah in Jamaat in the mosque and see to it that they reach the mosque before Akama so that they are in time. How can you do it? Nowadays it's very easy. You have several applications of prayers, of salah. You just go the app store if you have iphone or go to the google store if you have an android and type prayer or salah and there are hundreds of apps available these apps give you a reminder at the time of salah and depending upon the app you can even change how many minutes before you want the alarm to go on or go off as far as i'm concerned i take extra precaution that i should reach the masjid in time not only before akama but few minutes before so that i can even offer the sunnah salah what i do though i've got various apps i prefer keeping alarms and i keep minimum three alarms for every salah based on the adhan of every salah the five time salah i put an alarm of five minutes before the adhan time where I'm staying in Putrajaya, in Malaysia. This is the first alarm. Second alarm is at the time of Adhan. And the third alarm is few minutes late. The first alarm is an indication for me that whatever work I'm doing, I should stop in the next few minutes, maximum five minutes. So that whatever work I'm doing, I should wind it up. And I see to it that I never pick up any calls once the first alarm begins to ring, I do not take any other work. I do not pick up calls. This time is now dedicated to see to it that I reach in time for the most important appointment. The most important appointment is the appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Salah. So the first alarm is the indication for me that five minutes are left for Adhan. I should wind up what am I doing. I should not take any other new work. The second alarm is on the dot when is the time for Adhan. At that time I leave everything and I go and do my wudu. I go to the washroom, I take about two minutes for that. I do my wudu, that takes another two minutes. Then the third alarm rings, depending upon how much time I require to reach before the Akama. Before every Salah, there is either two rakat 
of four rakah sunnah. Before Fajr, there are two rakah sunnah. Before Zohar and Asar, there is four rakah sunnah. Mawqada and Gair Mawqada. Before Maghrib and Isha, there are two, two rakat. So if there's two rakat, I see to it, I reach at least three minutes before Akama. Because to read two rakat takes about two to three minutes. I know the time I take from my house, going by lift to the mosque, exactly is three minutes. I leave my house four or five minutes before, because sometimes the lift may take one minute to come up, sometimes two minutes. Most of the time the staff see to it that the lift has already arrived for me, I reach on time. So I leave five minutes plus three minutes before, eight minutes before Akama. My bell rings if I have to offer two rakah sunnah. That is for the Fajr time, for the Maghrib and Isha time. For the Zohar and Asr time, we have to pray four rakat. The alarm rings five plus six minutes, 11 minutes before Adhan time or 10 minutes before Adhan time so that I reach in time for my Salah. When I am living in Putrajaya, the Akama time is 15 minutes after the Azan time. In most parts of the world, it is 20 minutes. So based on that, I do my Vudu exactly at the time of Adhan, I do my Vudu, I go to the washroom, I prepare myself and if it's 4 Akata I have to read, immediately after Vudu, I leave, the alarm rings and I leave the house. If I have to offer two rakah salah, that is for Fajr time, Maghra Manisha, I may have one or two minutes after doing the wudu. When the alarm rings, I leave so that I am in time. To be punctual for the salah is very important. See to it that before the akama starts, you should reach the mosque. You have to base the timing depending upon how far is the mosque from your home or from your office place. You do the timing, set the alarm and believe me, you will find a world of a difference. You will find the serenity in your life. You will find the calmness, the peace in your life. Offering salah in jamaat, in the mosque, on time. And for a practicing Muslim, his full day revolves around salah times. What time he eats depends upon the salah time. What time he meets people depends upon salah time. What time he gives appointments. Everything is related to salah. That if I want to meet someone, it should not clash with Salah time. I'll give him, okay, come two hours before Salah or one hour before Salah or immediately after Salah is over. And my timetable is everything revolving around Salah. So Salah is the most important deed that Allah will ask you. The first deed that Allah will ask you on the Day of Judgment is your Salah. So being on time is very important. I have alarm for these five compulsory Salah as well as from my Tahajjud. Tahajjud is the most important, Qayyamul Layl along with Vitar, is the most important Salah after the first Salah. It's not the Mawqada. Then is the two rakah Sunnah before the Fajr Salah. And many people come and tell me that Brother Zakir, I pray four times, four times Salah on time. But Fajr Salah, I cannot get up, what should I do? So I ask the person that suppose you have an appointment. They say that no, we sleep in the night but we don't get up and we can't get up. You know, so it's not our fault. I tell him that if you have an appointment early in the morning, maybe one hour before the sunrise, and that appointment is very important for your business. And in that appointment, there are high chances that you will earn a million dollar. So will you be able to get up on time for that appointment? He'll tell me if it's a million dollar, I will not sleep the full night. I said, why? A million dollar. I don't mind staying awake the full night. So I tell him that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the two rakah sunnah before the Fajr Salah is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. The earth and the wealth in it would be trillions and zillions of dollars. So for a million dollar you not sleep the full night, a prophet said two rakah sunnah before the Fajr Salah. Imagine what would be the value of the Fajr Salah. So if you know the real essence of the Salah and how valuable it is, there is no question that you will not get up. The problem is because you don't know the value, you are very relaxed. Imagine if you have to go and meet the Prime Minister, what will you do? You will get up early, you will reach before time, you will be dressed up in the best of clothes. Will you be late for the appointment with the Prime Minister? And the answer is no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compared to Prime Minister, Prime Minister is nothing. 
If you have to meet the king, what will you do? The appointment with Allah is the most important appointment of your life. How can you be late? So, if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful, is the most wise, is the most knowing, he is billion, trillion, countless times better than the king, or better than any prime minister or president in the world. So, if you have this faith, if you have this belief, inshallah, inshallah, you will see to it that you pray five times salah on time, including a tajjud salah. And if you are punctual, your full life will change, it will be disciplined and alhamdulillah you will find the peace and serenity and sakina in your life. The next question posed by brother Abdul Haq from Tamil Nadu, India. Is dawa compulsory? Yes, dawa is a fard, it is compulsory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3. He says, Wal asr, inna al insana la fi khusr, illa ladhin amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss. Allah is taking the oath of time that man is verily in a state of loss. Except those who have faith, those who do righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. This Surah Al-Asr is the Rahi Nijat. It is the path to Jannah. It is the criteria for any human being to go to Jannah. And Allah says in the Surah, Surah Al-Asr, that humankind is in loss, is in khasara, except if you have four things. Number one is Iman, belief, faith. Number two is righteous deeds, Amal Salihat. Number three, is watawasawbil haq that is inviting people, exhorting people to truth, that is doing dawa and islah. And number four is watawasawbil sabr, inviting people to patience and constancy. So for any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, that is belief, righteous deeds, inviting people to truth, dawa or islah, and inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four is missing, you may be a very good Muslim, you may be praying five times a day, you may have gone for Hajj, you may be giving zakat, you may be fasting in the month of Ramadan, but if you don't do dawa, if you do not invite people to the haq, then according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and go to Jannah, that is Allah's prerogative. But if you do not do dawa according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. According to Imam Shafi, he said that if this surah alone was revealed, it would have been sufficient for the hidayah, for the guidance of humankind. It's such a powerful surah. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah is dawa. So dawa is compulsory, it's not optional. Some people say it is farde kefaya. No, it's not farde kefaya, it is farde ain. It is compulsory, every Muslim should do dawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, at number 110, says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat nas. Say ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Ta'mun bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna an munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Because you enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. Allah is calling you a khaira umma because, the best of people because, you enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If you do not enjoin what is good and if you do not forbid what is wrong, if you do not do dawa, you are not fit to be called as khaira ummah. You are unfit to be called as the best of people. Therefore, doing dawa, inviting non-Muslims to the truth of Islam is compulsory. That's the reason Allah calls you as khaira ummah. Allah also says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Waman ahasunu qala mimman doila lahi. That who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Waman ahasunu qala mimman doila lahi. Wa amilu salihau. Wa qala inna nimna al-muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, who works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. The best profession, according to the glorious Quran, is a person who invites people to the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is a dai. The best profession for a Muslim is a dai. What is the beloved prophet? 
It was a messenger of Allah. He was a da'i. So da'wah is compulsory. And if you read the Quran, one third of the Quran is talking about the non-Muslims, about the Ahl Kitab, about the Jews and Christians. Kul ya al-Kafirun, kul ya al-Kafirun. Saying, say to the one who rejects the faith, say to the non-Muslims. Allah says, kul ya al-Kitab, say, O Ahl Kitab, say, O Jews and Christians. So all this Allah is telling you to tell them. Allah says kul 332 times in the Quran. Tell them, tell them, tell who? In a salah, in the masjid, the imam is reciting. Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Now everyone in the mosque are Muslims. They believe Allah is one. So who is the imam telling? Imam is telling us Muslims that when you go out of the mosque, say to those who don't believe in one God, that Allah is one. How many of us Muslims do that? The Imam is reciting, Kul ya al kafirun, say to those who reject faith. Everyone in the mosque, they have faith. Allah is telling the Muslims to go and tell those non-Muslims. Tell them. Allah is saying, Kul ya al kitab, say O people of the book, say O Jews and Christians. Allah says, Wala taqulu salasa. Do not say Trinity. How many of us Muslims follow the Quran? One third of the Quran is telling you, tell to the non-Muslims, tell to the Ali Kitab, tell to the unbelievers. How many of us Muslims do Dawa? Dawa is for the end. It is one of the criteria to go to Jannah. If you do not do Dawa under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you, as Allah says, Allah will forgive anything except the sin of shirk. And Allah wants to put you in Jannah, that's Allah's prerogative. But dawa is compulsory, is for the end, and every Muslim should do dawa as much as possible. It is the best profession. Hope that answers the question. And in limited time, we'll have to end the session here. Inshallah, we will meet next time. At the same time, inshallah, a little earlier, at 11.15 at the time of Malaysia, GMT would be 3.10. Next week, inshallah, even my son would be joining. So next time we'll meet for the program. Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Till then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhirul dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.